Hey there, it's time for the show, the Tatiana Show, where you make friends and talk life and crypto. Hello, everybody, and welcome to a security edition of the Tatiana Show. Josh is not joining us today, but he'll be with us here next time at thetatianashow.com. We're putting out shows on Tuesdays now. Once in a while, they go out on Wednesdays, but anyway, he'll be back with us next time. Today, I am joined by Ron Stoner, who is from CASA, but he's also been doing security stuff in the crypto space for many, many years. Um, I actually was tipped off to him by Nathan Hawk, who's been organizing the Philo Crypto Yawns and the Crypto Shit Show and all these really cool, neat events. And I was asking him, you know, Nathan, I need to learn more about security. Who should I talk to? And he sent me over to Ron. And on my team, Sarah, uh, who used to know you from Shapeshift, she was also like, Ron is the god of security. So ladies and gentlemen, you're in for a treat. Thank you so much, Ron, for joining us today on the Tatiana Show. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. And, and yeah, I love both Nathan and Sarah, both great people. Yeah, uh, well, you know, there's a lot of cool people in this space. So, you know, we always seem to find each other, right? So that was cool to, to make the connection. Um, for people who are unfamiliar with your work, obviously now you're over at CASA working with that great team. Um, if you could give us a little bit of background about what your career started out with and how you ended up in the crypto space. Yeah, it's it's uh, an interesting story for me. I, I kind of started off as the gray hat hacker. So I kind of had my foot in both pools with the, the black hat side and the white hat side. And uh, as I got older, we had some events in the world with uh, the Patriot Act, September 11th, and some charges with hacking would have been classified as domestic terrorism. So at that point in my career, I kind of made a decision to go more of the white hat side and get the training and the fundamentals to help protect against the hackers and the trolls and kind of some of the stuff that I was seeing on the early days of the internet at the time. So uh, as I'm building my career in these skill sets, uh, Bitcoin comes along and just like everybody else, all the hackers and security uh, researchers, I wanted to try to hack it. Uh, I didn't think it was secure at the time. I didn't really get it, but once I started to dive into it and saw the technology, it was very reminiscent of another piece of technology that I loved with PGP and GPG, being able to do encryption, pretty good privacy. Uh, when I looked at Bitcoin and I saw the similarities between the two, that's when I really got it, that you know there was uh, a lot of tech behind this, there was a lot of forethought with security, and that if it was operating with the same digital signatures and cryptography that GPG and uh, PGP were using, that this really had something there. And then the rest of it all kind of fell into place. And I knew at that point I wanted to get in the industry. Uh, so I've been doing this since 2013. Originally worked for uh, an exchange called TrueCoin and then kind of moved on to some other opportunities with Shapeshift. And currently I'm with Casa. Casa is awesome because we're all about security and, and protecting you against all the different threats that are out there. So everyone knows that you know you shouldn't put your seed phrase online or you shouldn't put your private keys online. But what happens when you have the single hardware key with 500k worth of Bitcoin on it and your house burns down? You know you're going to lose that information. So at Casa, we've kind of looked at all those different uh, different scenarios and and. Uh, anomalies that can happen with storing funds and maintaining your funds. And we've tried to build our system to help protect our users against all of that. Outside of kind of working in the industry with career, I do a lot with the educational space. So I recently created the uh, cryptocurrency security standard auditor exam for C4. And what that is, is it's basically an auditor exam that tests a whole variety of controls uh, for crypto information systems that are accepting and processing transactions. And it's things like, how did you generate your keys? Uh, what was the entropy when you generated those keys? Where are you storing those? Um, so I've spoke a lot on that. I've done a lot of training. And then I also do a lot with organizing in the blockchain village for DEF CON, as well as a bunch of different hackathons and projects in the space. So uh, a lot of different irons in the fires, but this is this is what I love to do. Wow, that's a lot. Um, okay, so I don't even know where to begin, but I think I'm going to start at Casa Hoddle because one of the things that prompted me to um, bring you onto the show is, you know, I have some crypto. A lot of people in the crypto space have crypto. And even though I've been trained on proper security and I do maintain it, I still think that there's a lot of different holes. And 
I realized that people really avoid this topic altogether because it's so overwhelming, right? Okay, well, do I have my password manager? Where do I write down that password? How do I make a password that I'm not going to effing forget it every single time? You know, and where if if you go on to have I been pwned or whatever, then they're telling you, oh, you're going down. And then you're like, oh, my gosh, my stuff is out there. And and, you know, at this point, every single email has probably been hacked for most people that I know, not me. But I mean, everybody's info is out there. And then sometimes I'll help um, family members or something trying buy crypto. And then their password situation is a total nightmare. So how do we go from total disasters to like at least a little bit better, right? So I'd love to tackle a couple of those things and then talk about what we're doing more broadly in this space to make these improvements less difficult for people like me. But when you talk about Casa Hodl, I want to understand a little bit more. So I'm a crypto holder. Do I go there and do I pay them, you know, a thousand dollars and then they say, okay, this is what you should do with your crypto. Like, what is that service exactly? So the service is tailored uh, to the customers based off of um, kind of your level of security and your, your level of holdings and your, your degree of comfortability with that risk. So we're not mm -hmm. necessarily doing um, anything secret saucy. This is all open source technology. It's multi-signature technology, but we're basically creating a system for users to come in and use multiple hardware keys to store their crypto in a way where you don't have to retain all the seed words and keep them in the safe or anything like that. Um, with multi-signature, you, you're, you're having five keys instead of one key, for example. And those five keys, you would need three of them. You would need a quorum to move those funds. So by putting your, your funds into a multi-key setup, you're removing the risks of a single key, and you're also removing the risks of having to maintain your seed words and those things in the safe where uh, if somebody steals the safe or you didn't write down a word correctly and you go to restore it, you know you may have lost those funds. So with our product, we've architected it in a way that you know, if your phone breaks, if your hardware key breaks, if something goes missing, um, if something's stolen from an office where you're securely storing these things, uh, you don't lose all your funds. You lose that single device and we're able to rotate that out and keep your funds secure and keep you moving forward. So is it consulting or is it like software as a service where you just enter in your information I don't even know if I use that term correctly. Look at me trying to be all technical. But do you know what I'm saying? Like, is it like, how do you use it? Do you guys just say, okay, Tatiana, listen, this is, this is bad. You got to do all these things. And then you walk me through it. Or is it something where you plug it in and I say, oh, this is my sins. And you say, okay, do, 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 this is your pro prognosis. <laughs> yeah. So I think one of the things that differentiates us, anybody can use multi-signature, but uh, our advisors and our team are, are experts in this. And we do calls with each of our customers to go over all of the security concerns and what you should be doing and what you shouldn't be doing. But the actual product itself is, is a software platform. So it's managing your hardware keys in that multi-signature setup. And it's really cool because it gives you a visual representation where if one of those keys is broken or isn't working, it'll actually show you in the app and it'll highlight it to say, you know, you need to replace this one of this five that's not working currently. So we're doing things like health checks in the app, but we're also doing the, the touch point with the customer where we really want to understand their security concerns and make sure that we're, uh, we're, we're taking care of those for them. So is that something that's affordable? Do you have to be a crypto billionaire in order to be uh, able to work with you guys? Like what if you're just an average hodler? I know a lot of regular people. No. Do, do you guys help them? Like is there a scaling solution? Yeah, we do scale the based solution. Based on if you're rich? And it, it's usually based off of the amount of holdings that you're you're uh, you're holding in your, your multi-signature setup or your single ski setup if you're looking to move. Um, so mm -hmm. depending on the user, if you're a user that just wants to go for a little bit more security to go from a single hardware wallet to maybe a, uh, a two of three setup where you don't use hardware wallets at all, we can do a, a smaller plan for that. If you're somebody that owns like 100K or 500K or more in crypto holdings, we're going to suggest a higher tier where you have more hardware wallets, but we also include things like um, uh, inheritance planning and, and what do you do when that stuff comes up. I don't know that a lot of people are thinking about that. And there's there's been a lot of talk in this space. I think um, Pamela Morgan talks a lot about this with inheritance planning and estate planning, but it, it's something that I don't know that people are really thinking about. They're watching the price each day. They're thinking about their holdings. They're loving the freedom and the liberty aspect, but they're not thinking about what happens when they're not here. What's their family gonna do? Are they gonna understand what a seed is or what a block 
you know, how do they, how are they going to sign these things? Do they really understand this system? Yeah. I was going to ask about Pamela because she's got the book on it. I have it. Um, I started doing it one day. I got to get back to it. That's the whole thing, right? It's so overwhelming. Um, so I think that that's a really great, great service. Do you guys ever do that with larger corporations? How are larger corporations? Cause there's all these big, big dogs coming into the industry. One of the things that I like about Casa is that they seem a little bit more rock and roll, like, ah, we're rebels. But are you guys servicing corporate clients or just a bunch of uh, radical crypto people? Um, I, I would say the majority is holders that have been in the space or people that are getting in the space, but we are seeing a lot of interest from institutions and treasuries. That's kind of the, the big word that we've seen over the past couple months is, um, you know, Michael Saylor, Grayscale, BlackRock, all these people are starting to get involved in a public way. And uh, it, it's driving, I think, a lot of the chatter and innovation in this space right now. Um, I don't know that those clients necessarily fully understand the security ramifications yet. So I'm hopeful that as they're coming on board and they're learning some of these things, they are going to see that, oh, there are some gaps in the security process or there are some things that we don't understand. Let's go talk to the experts to see what they say. Okay. So let's talk a little bit more broadly, right? We've got Casa. I think that's cool. I'm going to hit you guys up because I want to see, do you guys do consultations so people know if it's a good match or whatever? Yeah, we can schedule a demo for you with one of our client advisors. They'll do a call, kind of understand your concerns and see if it's a good fit for you. I think that would be great because I would even want other people to take away that responsibility as, for example, like when somebody asked me, oh, help me set up my crypto. And I'm like, I don't want to because I know you're going to lose your password, you jerk. Like, but you, then they think you're being mean. And then, and then you tell them, listen, this is really important. Security is really important. And their eyes are glazed over. You know, they're not listening to you. So how do we, okay. So I'm a regular person, crypto aside, what do normal people do wrong with their passwords? Um, and like their password management, right? They're using password one, two, three, right? Um, what else, like, what are some things that they can fix right away uh, besides, you know, the obvious, it, well, actually, no, include the obvious because the obvious, sometimes people don't even know to take that step. I, I will tell you, I think the, the biggest problems people do is, is password reuse. They use these systems and these methodologies that we come up with as humans and as humans, we're walking, talking pattern generating machines. So we've all got our routines. We got our things that we think nobody else knows. And by coming up with these weird systems to say, I'm not going to use this, but I'll use this for a password, you're actually reducing your potential entropy pool. And I think making yourself less secure as a result. Um, if you're not using a password manager, number one, that's the very first thing you guys should be doing. Um, there's a variety of them out there with Dashlane, one password and LastPass. And you which is the best one, I got to say, because I'm always wondering which one is the best one. I, I think it's really dependent on people and their security posture. So uh, a lot of the cloud services get flacked because they're cloud services. And while they are encrypting data with keys and encryption keys and things that you maintain, you're still putting a degree of trust into them into the cloud provider. So I, I think it's a person where you need to look at your, your security risks and and uh, figure out which one works for you. If you want to go with a cloud provider, LastPass, 1Password, they all pretty much work the same. They all have mobile integration. They all use hardware keys, which I really like, Yubi keys, which is something else that we can, we can dive into in a little bit. Um, but I would say it's not only just using a password manager, it's using a password manager and making those passwords unique and random. Because what'll happen is if I hack your Facebook, I'm immediately going to take that password and hit the Alexa top 10,000 websites on the internet to see if you reused it. Um, the other thing is, is when you generate those passwords, they should be totally unique and random. You should never be using uh, song lyrics, movie quotes, Bible passages, any of those things, because I can tell you as a hacker, I've already scraped all that stuff and built it into password dictionaries. And I do hacking and comp for competition and sport. And the last time I did this, I think I ran like 1.4 billion passwords in 10 minutes. So if I'm a motivated attacker and you give me a month, how long is it going to take me before I actually hit your password? Okay, so that gives me, you know, Ajita, because, all right, I have my my password management system and it has the, the auto generator, right? But if I want to go into Fed, I mean, Facebook, I'm going to have a really hard time remembering that weird word, right? And so, like, the only one that I would have to remember is what the last pass one and that's it because that seems really difficult to, I don't know. I mean, I guess that's it. Well, it's the beauty of it. You just have to have a really hard password for everything. I mean, 
I don't know. What if you don't have your last pass available and you need your password to something else that's also accessible? Like, I, I don't like, is there a way that you can use, for example, you know, multiple words and then you mix them together and then still have a recognizable like something so it's not just like a gibberish yeah the i actually have trained people on this so the, you're right you want to set all these complex passwords and then your password manager remembers them so if you don't have access to your password manager and you're going to fed or facebook and you can't log in um you're, you're not going to be able to do that because you're not going to remember that 32 or 64 long randomized character string so you would need to remember one password the password to get into your password manager and here's what i recommend because those hackers have scraped all that information and they are trying all these common things that are out there. What I recommend is you take something that's personal to you. So nothing that's gonna be in your social media, nothing I can find from doing an open source search of you on the internet. And I like to recommend two, two things because people can identify with them. The first one would be um, your childhood bedroom. So when I say that and you go to that memory, you always have like the same memory of you sitting in your childhood bedroom. And let's say, for example, you're on the edge of your bed. So when you're in that memory, I would say to you, what's in the uh, the directions, north, east, south, and west? So in front of me in the north is a door, to the right of me is a trophy, behind me is a shelf, and to the left of me is a wall. So if I need to come up with a password that I can sit down and remember for my password manager, I go to that memory and I go north, east, south, west, what's in front of me, what's to the right of me, what's behind me, what's to the left of me, trophy, door, shelf, wall. I've now got four words that I can slam together. I could put a character or number or whatever I need to meet the requirements. And I've got a secure password that I'm not gonna find looking at your social media, doing open source searches, the name of your dog, those types of things. Um, another example I like to give is the first car, if you drive. So you're sitting in your first car in the parking lot. Where are you? What's the store in front of you? What's to the right of you? What's behind you? What's to the left of you? And if you can do that, you're going to come up with a secure password that's up here that I'm not going to be able to get by doing those open source searches and information. That's great. That was super useful. Um, okay, so what about... Um... Well, I want to go into cell phones, right? Because I feel like that's where all of our nightmares lie. But before we do that, a YubiKey, right? I have a YubiKey. I had to get it immediately, you know, next day delivery. Now it's been sitting in my drawer for several months, uh, completely unopened and with promises to one day use it. What's the deal with a YubiKey and those kinds of hard devices, right? Like, those seem a little bit scary because I'm a person that loses my keys. I lose my this, I lose my that. It's a total nightmare. How do you manage that kind of a device and how do you interact it with, let's say, your password manager? Yeah, it does take a little bit of learning to do it, but it does increase your security. So with security, everything's a trade-off. Um, it's always going to be... Uh, you know, ease of use versus the system versus security of the system. And you have to be careful because if you make a system too secure, as you said, the users either aren't going to use it, it's going to sit in a drawer somewhere, or they're going to bypass the controls and you're less secure as a result. Um, for those that don't know what we're talking about, this is a Yubi key. It's a little USB hardware device. And this keeps key information, uh, private and public keys uh, for GPG. So this can be used for digitally signing and encrypting information. So you can stop. Yeah, wait, wait, wait. What's GPG? One more time. Because I've heard that thrown around and I'm always like, oh, yeah, GPG. But what's GPG? <laughs> uh, GPG stands for, I think, New Privacy Guard. It was a fork off of PGP, which is pretty good privacy. When we mentioned those, those terms, um, there's some technical differences, but you can use those interchangeably when you're talking to people. And it's essentially just a private public key pair very similar to Bitcoin private public key pair, but what you're using those keys for is for authentication, for signature, and for encryption. So the YubiKey will do that. And then the other benefit of the YubiKey is it can manage your OTP codes, those six digit numbers that we get that we type in as our second factor of authentication. Most of us use our mobile phones. So we have Authy or Google Authenticator where we've scanned that QR code. And the way that that works is that QR code is actually a C. It's just random uh, numbers and letters. And that C generates a time-based code. So that's how we get those six-digit pins. It takes the C, checks the time, generates a code, and then the algorithm checks that it's correct. The problem with that is mobile phones have a variety of antennas. They have an app store. There's people that root them. They do side loading of apps. And if I'm an attacker and I can get access to your phone and exploit it and either dump those pins or watch as you're entering those, I've now compromised your 2FA. So the great thing about the YubiKey is this can manage your 2FAs. And because this is offline, this is not an internet connected device, I can't hack into this as a remote attacker. By design, they're not supposed to be uh, 
able to be hacked physically, but uh, anytime you have physical access to something, you want to consider it potentially compromised. But these are great because they do uh, they do generate your your OTPs. It puts the seed on here. But there are some educational and, and some training considerations where if you lose this or this breaks and you don't have your 2FA recovery codes, you could be screwed or you're locked out at that point. And then you have to go through all of the support verification to get back in. OK, but I get these codes when I get the YubiKey going. So it's like, all right, I lose the YubiKey, but I've got the codes. Oh, this is a good question. So let's say you're a loner. Uh, and you don't want to trust your family or friends, right? Sometimes people, they'll put some of these key codes into a, um, you know, security box or whatever inside the bank. Um, security boxes, that's what they're called, right? So uh, what is that a good idea? Because I've heard that they're actually not such a good place to keep those kinds of secret items because they can be seized. Right now, obviously, the world's a little bit of a scary place. Who knows what's going to happen with the banking system? So what's the story there? Is that a safe place to keep those kinds of things? I think it depends on what you're storing. And you're, you're, I wouldn't store my OTP codes in a safety deposit box because, as you said, they can be subpoenaed. They can be subpoenaed and accessed without your knowledge. So to me, if I was looking for that ultimate level, paranoid level of security, I wouldn't be relying on, on safety deposit boxes. I would be looking for other methods or things that work within my system that still meet some of those security controls. So I would think at that point, uh, tamper evident bag, with that under some sort of access control lock that you controlled would give you a, a better degree of confidence than having it in a safety deposit box somewhere. Okay, cool. Or, you know, you could just dig a hole in the back of the car or whatever, and not in the back of the car, back of the yard. Um, okay, cool. So I feel like we got some good, good, juicy, regular things. What's the story with Authy and Authenticator? Because people say that sometimes those are a little bit sketchy. Are Google products safe? Because I'm not really that into Google lately and they don't seem to be that uh, people friendly. So do people have to start using different emails? You know, if I've been using like, I don't know, Gmail or something forever, I mean, do I have to move all my emails over to ProtonMail? And is ProtonMail safe? Because I read that ProtonMail isn't even that great either. This is the the same problem with VPNs and things like that. And it, it again goes back to the ease of use versus security and convenience. Um, everyone loves Google because it's great to use, but we know that they're harvesting data. So if you're a startup company that wants to move quick and doesn't have a lot of budget, you know, G Suite's very easy to get up and running, but eventually you should be looking to moving to other services that either you control as a company, and that way you're maintaining your data and, and not having to rely on a third party provider. It's the same thing I think with uh, centralized exchanges and VPN providers, where you'll talk to people and they say, you need to use a VPN, you need to use a VPN, you gotta do it. And then when you look into it and you look at the free tier VPNs, you understand that, oh, these are actually honeypots that are collecting a lot of information. So I, I would be a little bit wary about some of those, but I think you do have to ultimately uh, release some degree of trust to that system if you want to be a user in it. Um, with ProtonMail, again, you can hear these things that they say it's secure, or it's not secure, but if you can't actually verify that yourself, it's going to have to be a degree of trust at that point. So I would say it, it's really what is your level of paranoia and security? If you're just a very simple, low-level base user that's not worried too much, G Suite's gonna work for you. You can put UV keys behind it so you have to tap the hardware so that an attacker can hack into your account, but you may be giving up some of the data control. Um, if you're a little bit more paranoid, maybe you move to uh, an Enigma mail or a Proton mail and you're GPG encrypting all of your communications. Um, and then if you're ultimately super paranoid, you're gonna be running your own SMTP server in a data center that you're paying with Bitcoin under a pseudonym so that nobody can ever trace that back to you. I think the better thing to do is figure out how you can use some of these centralized services in an anonymous way. So with the YubiKey, you can use that to encrypt your email. So even though you are using Gmail and they're reading all that contents, if that contents is encrypted, they're not getting anything out of that. They may get some metadata to see that Ron emailed Tatiana, but they don't see the contents of our conversation. What about Google phone numbers or different kind of cloud phone numbers versus getting a phone number from T-Mobile? You've got you know the thing with Michael Turpin and AT&T. There's a lot of insecurity with having a phone. So what do you do in order to mitigate that? And are there any phone companies that are better? I've heard that there's some secret phones that you can get and they're less likely to get in trouble. So what's the deal with phone numbers? Uh, phone numbers are interesting. I, I think the best step that anybody could take is 
breaking the association between your phone number and your accounts. Because as an attacker, once you link those two things as an attacker, I'm going to compromise your account. It doesn't matter if you set up 2FA or you have the, the strongest password. What I'm going to do is I'm going to call T-Mobile and go, hey, this is, uh, this is Tatiana. I'm up in the mountains. I just got a new phone and it's not working. Uh, I have my old phone here. Can you put my SIM on the account? And if I get the right customer representative or I social engineer them correctly, I've now got access to your text messages and everything that's coming through your SIM card. So the first thing I'm going to do is go to Google and say, reset my account. And they're going to text the reset code to the number, and it's going to bypass all those controls that you put on there. And then once that one falls, I'm going to keep moving forward and reset all of the other accounts. So what I would recommend, I think the best course of action from a security standpoint is people should be breaking that association. You shouldn't be adding your phone number to uh, the different social sites. You shouldn't be including it on your Gmail. Uh, you should remove that because then when somebody does SIM swap you, they're not going to get anything. They can't get into any accounts. If you wanted to go a step further, um, I've heard Andreas and a couple other people in the industry talk about it, and this is a step that I myself have taken. I use a phone provider that does not have a brick and mortar store. So the way Michael Turpin, um, one of the ways he got hacked was they actually created a fake ID and impersonated him in a physical store. It was a very ballsy move to do that, but it worked. And as a person that works in this industry, that scares the hell out of me that somebody can pull off that attack. So I've actually moved my service to another provider that uses virtual SIMs um, and does not have a, uh, an actual brick and mortar store for somebody to go into. Now that provider, again, uses YubiKey authentication for the account and all of the different security things that I like. So that I'm sure an attacker is not gonna be able to get into my account. And even if they do, it's not gonna be tied to Coinbase or any of my crypto holdings or anything that they're gonna wanna get into. Um, when it comes to VoIP numbers like Google Voice and all of those, uh, I'm actually a fan because I think it adds a layer of abstraction between you and whatever service provider you're using. So when you're registering for sites or you're buying hardware wallets, why do you need to list your actual phone number? You should be listing a Google Voice phone number that you can log into remotely that doesn't tie back to your actual identity. Oh my gosh, this is so overwhelming. Um, so what do people do if they've already had their phone number? You know, let's say you've had your phone number forever. What is this new number supposed to go to? Anything only associated? Because for example, you can take your phone number off of an account, but they're always hitting you up for it. They always want that phone number. Yummy, yummy. You know, what do you do uh, for day-to-day -day stuff? Or do you have just a special secret crypto phone number? Yeah, I've got a couple phone numbers that I use. Just like email accounts, I bucket email accounts where I have a subset of emails for my social profiles, a subset for banking, a subset for crypto. And I silo them so that if one of those does fall, I don't lose everything. It's not the keys to the kingdom. And it is a lot of work. It's a ton of work to go through and set up all the recovery controls and recovery codes and making sure everything's behind a hardware key. Um, what I would say is when you want to do that, take a weekend on a rainy weekend and go through and audit all your accounts and security settings. Try to hack into them yourself. You know the password, but try to get into your account without the password. Do all the reset functions and see what are they asking me for? And that should help you drive, well, this is the information that I really need to protect. So if Google is sending resets to a phone number, number one, it shouldn't be on there. But if you didn't want those going to a personal phone, that's when I would start using that Google Voice or those burner numbers or whatever solution you've decided works for your security system. Okay, cool. What about burner phones? I mean, if you buy a burner phone, aren't you buying it from T-Mobile or whatever? Yeah, the it, it, burner phones, the actual burner phones themselves aren't, aren't very good because they are tracked and they do want payment methods. And if you go into a 7-Eleven or a Wawa and you try to buy that stuff, they're going to ask for some information. Um, there's a concept of burner numbers where there's some sites and services that'll give you like one-time use numbers to be able to put onto things so that you'll pass the verification or you'll pass their, their check and then you don't need to use it. You can drop that again. Um, I'm not so much of a fan of that because some of those sites will register that phone number for you. So I think that actually just abstracting it away to like a, a Google Voice or Voice over IP provider with temporary disposable um, burner type numbers, secondary numbers, that's going to be the way to go. All right. I'm going to have to listen back to this episode. I'm like mentally making notes. I'm like, oh man, oh no, I got to do this. I got to do that. Um, okay. So I have heard people talk about um, bringing a little bit back to crypto again, uh, saying that you should run your own node. Um, do I need to do that? Does everybody need to do that? Why is that important? I like running my own node. It, it's something where if you're not a, a hugely technical user, it, it may be something that's a little bit too daunting for you. 
But if you understand the Bitcoin system and the fact that, you know, these are sovereign chains and we need copies of these sovereign chains distributed across the world, number one, you're contributing to the security of the system. So that's why you would run your own node. Number two, if you're a person that does a lot of transactions and you're using Electrum, when you're using some of those, those software sites, it's broadcasting that transaction out through different nodes and endpoints. And you may be a person that doesn't trust those or you want to control that process all the way through. So what you would do is you would run your own node with your own valid sovereign copy of the chain data. And when you were doing uh, operations through wallets or things like that, you could point them to your node. So you know that that's routing the transaction instead of some random node somewhere else that you don't know. Um, by design, you should be able to trust that stuff based off of the checks in the protocol. But, uh, you know, the, the saying is uh, verify, don't trust. So if you're that type of person, you're going to be running your own node and verifying the data. Okay, um, cool. So that sounds like something maybe not everybody needs to do. When we first started out in crypto, um, we were promised anonymity. And now we've got, you know, chain analysis and a whole bunch of other people tracking our stuff. I don't do anything bad, but I don't want anybody tracking my stuff. So the other day I was talking with Giacomo and one of the things that he was talking about was using, you know, a coin mixer. And I asked um, an OTC guy about it. And he said, oh, well, if you use a coin mixer, you're already raising the ire of the government for using it in the first place. And I'm irritated because things are very scary right now. And people are being called domestic terrorists that two weeks ago were like nerdy Republicans. You know, why are they all of a sudden something different? And my family's Polish or my mom's side. So we grew up like with the horror stories of what happened in World War II. Um, so what do we do about keeping our coins secure? Can we not use um, coin mixers? Is that illegal? Like, what's the story there? Can you keep any kind of uh, privacy? And what if you want to buy Bitcoin with just a bank account? Are we just all going to be in the system now? What happened to our promises? Yeah, it, it's... It's a battle the industry has been fighting since the inception. And the goalposts are kind of always moving where the definition of a security, while there is a standard definition, it could be applied differently depending on the context of conversation. So if you're talking to an SEC or an OFAC or somebody like that, they may have a different interpretation versus the crypto anarchist that you were just talking to about where that really sits. So I, I yeah, it's a big problem and I don't think that there's an easy solution for it. The things that I'm really excited about that I think are gonna help with this is like the Schnorr upgrade with, with Taproot. So right now when you do digital signatures with ECDSA, uh, as you said, I can go on the chain and I can see that you, know, you signed this transaction and these inputs were sent to this address as these outputs. But when we get to Schnorr signatures, what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna aggregate all those signatures into one. So it's actually gonna bring back some of the privacy components and anonymity that we uh, we all were kind of very excited about in the very beginning. And I think it's relearning a little bit of, of what this is. So we all, Bitcoin hit and everyone said, this is great, this is anonymous. But nobody was saying, well, it's really pseudo anonymous, right? We're not fully there yet. We're getting there and it's a great innovation and we're getting all of these benefits from the traditional fiat banking system that we're all trying to get away from today. Um, but I don't know that all of the privacy benefits that we all want and have envisioned from the very beginning are there yet. They are coming and they're gonna take a little bit of time. Um, but I think Schnorr, when that comes, that's gonna help protect people. Uh, you're right with, with sites and services and KYC, it's a very scary industry right now. But I would suggest that there's still a few ways that if you wanna get involved and do it in a pseudonymous way or an anonymous way, that people can. Um, number one, Brave Browser is great for, for giving crypto back to users and you do have to allow them to put ads and things on your desktop but I've taken some of their bat tokens and converted that into other crypto. So that was a way to onboard into this industry. And I know some users that are using Brave just for the security features alone that are now onboarding into the crypto industry and don't even realize it. Um, yeah, I love Brave, by the way. I, I've made a lot of money from the Brave browser. I'm so surprised sometimes, like quite a lot just for doing my regular thing. I don't know, maybe people are tipping me on there. So it might be a little <laughs> bit different. So I don't know. 
but I think it's awesome. Um, it's a great piece of security software and it's rewarding people in crypto. And then the other thing that not a lot of people are talking about is you can work for crypto in this industry. You don't just have to go to a site and give up your ID and buy it. There's a lot of people that are doing consulting or they're doing bug bounties or they're doing these little tasks for different corporations and they're getting this crypto anonymously in a way that they still control it. And if somebody does chain analysis on it, they're not gonna be able to tie that back to you. So I would say for mixers and things like that, I think it's a technology that people are trying that that works, but I know that having been involved in some funds recovery and investigations, um, the second you see those mixers or Wasabi or Tornado Wallet or those things come up in chain analysis, you know that probably somebody's trying to hide something for some reason. It's, it's the whole problem with Tor when it first came out, right? They wanted spies to be able to communicate securely, but if that's the only encrypted traffic, you know that that traffic should be looked at because there's something special in there. So when you open that up and you have the signal to noise ratio where you can hide it, that's a little bit better for your privacy and your handling. So the people that are working to make Bitcoin more private, couldn't they theoretically be harassed by overzealous governments and say, you know, well, we don't know who Satoshi is, but this guy, he's been working on the code and uh, I don't know, let's get rid of him. Like, couldn't they just do that or no, because then another... Um, coder would just fill in the space somewhere else. And eventually people would be kind of afraid, right? They'd say, oh, I don't want to be involved in this, right? Yeah, I, I, so I think the concept of, you know, GitHub doing um, multiple people in the pipeline with doing code approvals and pushes is going to help to stop some of that. You're right, a government could lean on an individual developer, but the whole concept of decentralization to not have a single point of failure where even if you do have a compromised developer, it shouldn't matter. The community should come to consensus and rise above that. So with the uh, code commits, with keeping people in the pipeline, um, the other thing is we can always fork. So if we do see that some stuff has happened, the concept of forking is available to move to different code bases. And it's the beauty of open source is that anybody can go in and, and make a derivation of, of something that they don't like or make a change. And if you can get the community and the network and the consensus behind it, it doesn't matter if you're trying to poison the well on the, that previous software version. Wow. So tell me a little bit more before we got into the call that you've been working to kind of bring a lot of education around security. Um, we're coming a little bit closer to the end of the show, but I definitely want to know what's that look like? You know, how do people get involved? What has your involvement been like? Uh, I know that you were doing some stuff with DevCon. So yeah, fill me in. Yeah, there's two things that I'm really proud of. The first one is I'm the curator for uh, an auditor exam for the cryptocurrency security standard, the CCSS. And this was released by uh, C4, a nonprofit, and they're trying to push standards for security in the crypto space. So the CCSS is basically a matrix of of controls for things like, how did you generate your keys? Where are they being stored? It gets really technical, like did you use random K values for your digital signature? Because if you're reusing those or you're increasing those in a predictable manner, uh, I'm gonna be able to get some information out of your signatures and, and cause some bad times. So it goes into all those little different aspects of who has access to these things, how are they controlled? And we wrote an auditor exam to help test people that want to audit companies or information systems in this space against those controls. So the past couple of years, I've been working with that group on developing some training content and creating the exam. Um, and they just released one for the uh, certified Ethereum professional, or they're going to be releasing it very shortly here. Uh, so I know a lot of people are excited about that. And then the second thing that I love doing, I work with Nathan Hawk, as you mentioned at the beginning of the call, and Ajit Hadi. Uh, we organize and we present at the Blockchain Village at DEF CON, which is one of the biggest hacker conferences in the world. Um, and it's great because a lot of these uh, crypto conferences are, are pay to play, where people are coming in, they pay a fee, and then they show you a token or a technology. You're not really getting any benefit. And what we want to do is we're driving it more towards the research, security research stance. So white papers, RFPs, what are the cool things that are, people are working on that uh, aren't out yet or, or people aren't aware of? What are the cool security initiatives? You may be hearing about them now, but they may not be released for six months. And these are the people that we're bringing to the blockchain village at DEF CON um, that one, are in the industry, but two, also want to get involved or have an interest and don't know how to jump in. We're there. Come talk to us. We would love to get you involved. So are you seeing a lot of interest from the more broad security space in crypto? Um, has it peaked? You know, like, is it just something that's going to keep going or, or what? I don't even know that we've peaked yet. It, same with Bitcoin. Like, Bitcoin's died so many times and it. I don't even know that we've opened the floodgates to where we're really going yet. And I think it's the same thing with security. This is a very unique industry with 
very unique uh, technical concepts and terminology that we're reusing with wallet, seed, addresses, all of those things, keys. That's hard for people to understand. Um, it's harder for security professionals because a lot of professionals are coming from the banking industry or the Deloitte's of the world, and they go, we need to do X, Y, and Z. And that doesn't work in the crypto space, right? If you're doing some of those old world security controls, you're going to be in for a bad time. So I think it's a space that's still continually evolving. Um, and it's amazing to me because we're still seeing exchanges that have been operating for long amounts of time that still have hot wallets online or they have a single hardware key or a single signer for different operations. And in my mind, it's just a matter of time before they get hacked or they get rug pulled or something happens. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of things to, to think about with all this. It's very overwhelming, but I actually think that we got a lot of very good basic things for the average person to do. Um, do you think that the average person needs to be concerned about their security? You know, it seems like people's identities are hacked. You know, what is the scope of that kind of uh, event in somebody's life? I mean, I feel like people underestimate it. Uh, I remember when Lynn Ulbricht had her her stuff kind of broken into. I mean, that was like a nightmare watching her recover from that. Um, what do you think? Like, how can, is there insurance for that? There is some cyber insurance out there, but it doesn't really cover certain things. It's not very good. A lot of businesses have it, but it's only for very specific instances. And they maintain it just to say they check the box off in case they ever get hacked. Um, I think security is, is, is a shared responsibility for everybody. And it's a shared mindset. Because even if you're a person that's not worried about this company or their security controls or some of the uh, the things that can happen, the nasty things out there, you're still interacting with these sites and services every day. You're still giving KYC information. You're still using all of these, these, uh, these things and consuming them. So I think having an awareness of what can happen and what you can do to protect yourself before it happens is really, really going to be beneficial for people. Um, one of my friends was involved in a database breach and now gets consistent calls on their phone number about crypto related things. And that's extremely scary. So if he was to take some steps like using uh, the burner phone number and using a pseudonym and things like that when he was registering for these sites, that wouldn't have mattered much to him. Um, I can tell you as somebody that has been hacked and helps protect against this stuff in the industry, you don't know that feeling until it happens to you. And when you have to spend all weekend trying to recover funds or sitting there with support agents verifying identity, and you can still only get half of your accounts back and the other ones are now gone, that is a horrible feeling. So taking the steps to educate yourself, doing some of these small things like using a password manager, using unique passwords, it's going to benefit you a lot more later on to help prevent some of these situations and save you time and money. Is it better for somebody to keep all their funds in one location or to spread them out over multiple ones? Uh, so this is the, the honeypot argument. Um, I think it depends on the type of person you are. I would, I would not suggest keeping a large amount of funds on a single point of failure. And when you're using a single device, you're talking about a single point of failure, which is why I love Casa and the multi-signature product, because we're not relying on a single point of failure. And by distributing those keys, you do get some benefit, but you need to do it in a secure way. And this is part of the whole Dunning-Kruger effect with security in the crypto space, is that people are gonna tell you, you need to do this. But do they really know what they're talking about? Have they experienced it? Have they lost funds? Have they tested those controls and battle tested those with the expert? So when you say dispersing things around, I would be careful about that because some people do things like I break up a private key into three or four pieces and I keep them here so it's never always complete. Well, what if one of those pieces is gone? Now you have to brute force that last three fourths of the password. Are you gonna be able to do that? Did you really make yourself more secure or did you screw yourself by taking those steps? And I think it's getting above that Dunning-Kruger and really finding the experts in this space that have done these things and been doing it for years, rather than the people that are just, I'm a security expert, I'm now involved in crypto, let me give you some advice. Is it impossible for lost funds to ever happen? Like people talk about, Oh, supercomputers. Can can a supercomputer ever break into your uh break into your crypto? Like what if you lost it? Are the funds that have been gone by other people are they ever going to be back? People have, you know, find your wallet services. Is that real stuff? Uh some of it is. I actually have done recovery for users for wallets and things where they've lost passwords. But the only way to do that is if you can get some information about what password schemes they've used and hope that they use some sort of weak weak password with that. Um, for other Bitcoins, it's, it's unfortunately lost due to negligence or error, just forgetfulness. Um, 
the supercomputer aspect in quantum, quantum, I'm not as much worried about because we've got a lot of smart people working in this space that are bringing up these arguments. And just like uh, DSA in the 70s and RSA and some of these other encryption schemes and digital signature algorithms, they eventually fail because the computing power gets too good or they find a, a vulnerability in it. And we end up moving to something else. So what I would say is there may be some things on some older algorithms that quantum, once it hits the scene in a major fashion, can crack and get access to. But by that point, I would expect Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies to have forked or migrated over to better, more secure systems at that time. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's always one that comes up and I always feel pretty confident with the answer, but mm, a little bit unsure. Um, okay, so I think we're done with the show, but I want people to connect with you. Where can they find you? Yeah, you can hit me up on Twitter at Forward Secrecy. I also do my own consulting firm, stonerconsulting.io, if anybody's interested in going over some of the security stuff that we talked about today. Um, and then I'm also available at keys.casa. Awesome. Thanks so much. I got to talk to the Casa folks too. Thanks everybody. Check out the Tatiana show every Tuesday. And if you want to see the softer side of crypto, you can check out uh, the love podcast called proof of love cast.com uh, out on Fridays. So thanks everybody. What's the point of all this technology without a little love in our lives? Our hosts, Tatiana Moroz, Dr. Stephanie Murphy, and Lauren Kasovitz have come together to bring you proof of love. Go to proof of the Tatiana Show has been brought to you by CryptoMediaHub.com, a boutique marketing and PR agency for Bitcoin and beyond. Hey there, it's time for the show. The Tatiana Show, where you make friends and talk life and crypto. We got a thing. And reflect and use lots of intellect with our hearts when we work together. I know that it can be so hard out there looking all around and saying that life ain't fair. So that is why we will fight. And stay up late at night Listening to the Tatiana Show Thank you for listening to the Tatiana Show. Please follow us on Twitter at Queen Tatiana or on Facebook and Instagram at Tatiana Moreau's Music. More episodes can be found at thetatianashow.com and make sure you leave a review on iTunes and tell your friends. You are listening to the Tatiana Show. This show may contain adult content, language, and humor and is intended for mature audiences. If that's not you, please stop listening. Nothing you hear on The Tatiana Show is intended as financial advice, legal advice, or really anything other than entertainment. Take everything you hear with a grain of salt. Oh, and if you're listening to us on an affiliate network, the ideas and views expressed on this show are not necessarily those of the network that you're listening on or of any sponsors or any affiliate products you may hear about on this show.